Yeah, Coach uh, Farrell Cooper, um, how dangerous of a returner is he for the Cardinals? Well, it's very dangerous. They just signed him to the 53-man roster. And he's a bigger returner, around 5'11", 200 pounds. He can run through arm tackles. Um, a fearless returner. He could get east-west, and he could get vertical with the football with, with one cut. Right now, he's been a spark for them in the return game. I know last week versus uh, Tampa Bay, he had a couple of decent returns. And right now, he's averaging over a first down per return, upon return, with 14.3 yards of return. It's going to be a great challenge for us, making sure that we could get bodies on him, make sure we step to contact, and we're able to bring him down when we go to tackle him because he is a physical runner. What um, worked on that 28-yarder that they busted last week? Big returns happen in the NFL because of two things, lost leverage and missed tackles. So, yeah, you look at before the ball's punted, there's about five, five and a half guys on each side of the football, even just like on kickoff. And when you see big returns happen, whether it's kickoff returns or punt returns in the NFL, if you pause the tape, you usually see two guys to the left eight to nine guys to want the other side of the football. So lost leverage on the football and then missed tackles as well. So, you know, give credit to Arizona. They have a great special teams unit, starting with the coordinator, Jeff Rogers. They do a good job displacing guys and making guys lose leverage on the football to give their returner room to work with and get vertical with the football. Was you able to get your hands back on Bernhard a little bit more now? Will you try to look and see if he can help you at any spot? Are you talking about Jared? Oh, Bernie? Bernie? Yeah, Bernie, sorry. Um, Right now, you know, we're happy to have him back, back out on the practice field. Again, we're still just getting him back acclimated to the game. And, you know, whatever the best 53 that we get, our 48 on game day, we'll put the best 40 out there. But again, he's continued to get better. He's been out there catching balls and working on special teams as well as offense. And he's shown improvement just in one day getting him back on the field. So we're very happy and blessed to have him back. Season started, you were pretty optimistic about his potential as a special teams player down the road. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to determine much about that, given that he's been on IR? Yeah, I mean, he, he had a lot of reps, whether it was in practice, and I, I know he had very limited, maybe one to two reps on special teams, but he had a lot of reps, and he put a lot of reps in the bank during training camp, during OTAs, and even when he was before he went on IR. So we have a good idea of where positions that he can play, and we know the positions that he can play. And then if he is provided with the opportunity, we know that he'll be able to help us come that given that opportunity on Sunday or Sundays down the road. Will every decision you make in these last two games be based on the best player for that particular moment in the game? Or might you look at, whether it's Bernhardt or anybody else, I just want to see this guy in a game rep here. It's the best guys. It doesn't matter. And going back, it doesn't matter our record. It doesn't matter if we're not able to get into the playoffs. We're playing the best 11 guys. Our job, my job as special teams coordinator, is to make sure that we're able to win that down. We're not guaranteed a second, third, or fourth down, you know, the next down on special teams. So we're going to put the best 11 guys out there. And our mindset is how can we win that down to help our offense and defense out so we can win that game. And we're, we're always evaluating, even if we're playing the best 11 guys out there. We're putting the best guys out there that think they can help help us win our, win that game. So we're not in that that um, I don't know if you're trying to get to the question like, hey, are we just going to start evaluating guys or just putting guys out there just to look at them? We're, that we're not in that right now. We're playing the best guys and we're trying to win this game versus Arizona and win a home game. That's all that matters. In Bradley Pinion, um, over the course of the year, what kind of asset has he been for you guys? I'm just looking at the, at the numbers now. He's only had two touchbacks all year. Isn't that the second highest in his career? How has he been and how has he fit into what you guys like to do? He's been a great acquisition for us. Very blessed to have him uh, when it comes to his strong leg and, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, how the best way to say it? His overall experience as a special teams player, and he's been great for Ku. He's been great for Liam. He's been great for our, our core players. We talk about Mike Ford, Hodge, Troy, Eric. He's been a leader in the room, and in our room we have multiple leaders. We talk about leaders building, uh, building and creating other leaders in the room, and he's helped with that process. Very blessed to have him when it comes to his ability to hit touchbacks when needed, be able to cover kicks when needed, be able to hit directional punts when needed. Last week, you know, I love his resiliency because last week the, the wind was crazy at that stadium, and we had to do a better job of just keeping leverage on the football where you talk about not trying to give up big returns. And our coverage guys did a great job having Bradley's back when we came to those windy conditions. And he continues to get better each and every week. So we're very excited. And I'm very excited to see him you know, go out there and put out his best performance of the year come Sunday.
And, uh, are you surprised that uh, Matt Prater's still kicking uh, around pretty good for the uh, Cardinals at 38? Uh, you say, am I surprised? Yeah. No, age is nothing but a number. He's He's been doing it for a long time. He has them. I was actually with him in 2020 season, end of the year, where he broke the record for most 50 yard field goals made in a career. And right now he's at 70. And he has a strong leg, gets great hang time on his kickoffs. He, he's still good from 65 plus when it comes to field goals. So we have our hands full when it comes to him because he could do a, a lot of different things. And he's a great leader. I know he's a great leader in that locker room because he was for us in Detroit. Yeah, he was here and had a you know had problems early on, but eventually settled down. You see that with uh, some of the kickers that uh, you know some that we've seen over time. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that you never get put in positions that you can't handle. I think things that happen in life only makes you stronger. You look at things as blessings or lessons, and you can see with his career along with Koo, those things were lessons and at the same time blessings for them. And now that's why. Uh, Matt's having the career that he's had so far in um, in the NFL, and then his best days are still yet to come. So again, I'm very happy for him. It's going to be a great challenge this weekend going against Matt and uh, Arizona Cardinals special teams units. Anything special about uh, Lee, the punter? Hey, he has great directional ability. He's been doing it what for 19 years. Uh, he's one of the better directional punters in the NFL. He does a good job getting the ball off, getting up and through the football to force hang time. And they, they've played a lot of different gunners out there on punt. And with having a different, lot of different combinations at the gunner position, for him to still go out there and, and be able to you know, flip the field or pin guys inside the 20 is very impressive. So it's going to be really fun going against Andy this weekend and their units. You guys have made positive take points off the board plays at a couple different and or add points that go back to the Rams game. Mm -hmm. um, what's kind of been, been, been key to y'all, you know, making those big plays at different points during the game? In our room, we talk about great plays are made from great effort. In the NFL, when you come talk about specialist operation and pump protection, field goal protection, there's a lot of great protections. There's a lot of great operations. And the key thing for us is each and every down, we make that down count. Rather than count those plays, we make those plays count. So you never know when that opportunity is going to present itself, whether it's Troy blocking one versus the Rams and Ade blocking one this past week versus Baltimore. You never know. So every time we get lined up, if we're tied to the line of scrimmage, it's our job to win early in that down. You never see a guy get pancaked and then make a sack, right? You don't really see that. So how can we win early in the down? It's based, it's based on our basic fundamentals, pad level, stance, our eyes, our get off violence with our upper body and then understanding the rush plan and what we're trying to do. Sometimes you look at the field goal block, that was designed for Ade to block it. So D'Angelo, he does a great job knocking back the end. You have Abdullah and you have Horn making certain movements that free up Ade in that look. So the guys being selfless in those positions to understand, hey, I might not get this block, but I'm a part of it. And that's what it's all about. And then we talk about in the room, again, great plays are made from great effort. And I love our room that what we have in there from top to bottom because everybody helps us on special teams. We talk about from the quarterback all the way down to the D-line and O-line. And every single guy, when they go out there, they understand that it's a one-play mentality and we got to make the most out of that play. And it all starts with our effort, our attitude, and our technique. Yeah, Coach, um, what are some of the things you all want to see from uh, Desmond in his third game? Sure. Yeah, I think each game you go out there, right? You get new experiences. So for him, the first two are on the road, great environments, great defenses, a great test this week with Coach Joseph and what he presents uh, in terms of all the different pressure packages, fronts, and coverages. He's at home for the first time. Um, but like I've said before, no different than his first start to his second start. He is one of 11, right? And it's the rest of those guys going out there. It's another time for him to be in the huddle in different environments uh, with different guys and reacting to what he sees. And that's really what you want to see from all guys, young, experienced. You want to see in certain situations, like will they trust their training? Will they trust their fundamentals? Trust their eyes? And again, it's, it's always the evaluation, regardless of where you are in the season, no different than this week. And uh, slow starts, um, scored on the third drive, the first game, and the fifth drive, the second game. Anything you all can do to Yeah, I mean, that's, things? you know, as you see, right, you pointed out, it's not the goal to start that way. And so for us, right, it's you're, you're always constantly trying to establish a rhythm. Right? You're trying to attack a certain way. Um, 
But for us, it's about making sure we go out there confident, understanding what we potentially might get, and then reacting to what if it's not what we thought we're going to get, and then trust your training. So for us, it, there is a get out there, play fast, start fast mentality. Um, but again, right, the defense obviously has a say in it, and we have to be able to adjust. Um, I think guys have adjusted as, as the game has gone on the last couple of weeks. We obviously need to start faster than that, though. And uh, uh, rookie running back Tyler Algier, how has his progression been all season? For are you all in? Uh, in uh, are you all happy with the production? Yeah, I think when you you talk about him or, or any of the young players, right? If you look at, you got Drake London, you got Des and Algier here. You got three young players in their first year and guys that you know as other guys that we count on. But with Algier, right, it's, he's had a consistent growth pattern in terms of how he plays and how he approaches it. And I've said this about all young guys. There's a physical part of this, there's no doubt. But you want to see their mental, how they prepare during a course of a long season, right? This is the longest they played football. So there's also part of that, understanding there is you know, a certain mentality it takes to get through all these weeks. Um, and with all our young guys, we're preparing them. They're going out. We just had a walkthrough. They're locked in. And so we expect no different for the for the following couple of weeks. With with Drew Dahlman, um, from the, the mental aspect that calls and checks and all sure. the assignments that center has to do, how have you seen him? Yeah, you know, same thing. You way? know, you see it week by week in terms of uh, his ability to be comfortable. Specifically now with a new quarterback, there's different communication lines. Um, and for us, there's a, a constant with the other lineman that he plays with. He's had uh, other guys play next to him at left guard. And for him to be able to constantly communicate, uh, there is a, a comfort level with him at this point about going out there, understanding what he's seeing. And every time there's something new, just like all our, all our players, regardless of age, they're great communicators back to the coaches. And so it allows us as coaches to make adjustments with them. I think sometimes when it's one-sided and only the coach sees it and the player doesn't, I think sometimes it's hard for the player to understand where you want to go with it. When you have that equal communication, I think that ultimately allows you to be the best adjuster as a game moves on. And that's ultimately what football is in the NFL level. It's a game of adjustments. So the faster you can make an adjustment, stay one step ahead or fix your issue, usually the better off you are. And that's been a constant thing for us as we evolve this season. Um, the, the quarterback center chemistry, it, it, I don't know. Like, does it take time for that to be built? Or how have you seen Dez and Drew yeah, I think work together to Get in the right. I think it's different for different quarterbacks and center combinations. I think what helped us, right, is they've obviously been together since OTAs, training camp. We we rotate the centers. Uh, there was a competition. So none of that was really in the uh, the thought process of is there going to be an issue there. Uh, there was a comfort level and just no different than uh, the other guys hearing Dez's cadence. As much as you want to mimic everybody's cadence as the quarterback's all speak the same way. The reality is they all have different cadences and tones. So that's been another part of the process, and each week it gets better. I know A.J. Williams, he made the transition from defense to offense. How have you seen like, his progression over the course Yeah, it's a good question. I, with Avery, you know, he's played nickel, he's a returner, now he's playing offense. He's a football player. And so our task as coaches is to make sure that uh, we get guys involved in putting them in the best position. Uh, Avery is no different than uh, any other player that we have in the offensive skill set. He has a certain skill set, um, but more importantly, he understands football. And I know that sounds pretty simple, and you would think everybody at the NFL level would understand football. It's not always the case. And I think you just have guys who have a natural feel when the pitcher changes. Some guys go to the classroom and they see it exactly the way you told them. And then you go to the practice field and if it's that way, awesome. But the reality is it's probably not going to be that way sometimes because they're going to do something that's not has been seen or it's a one-off. And the guys who, when the pitcher changes, can still problem solve, then you really have a guy who understands football. And I think Avery, along with other guys, young and old on our roster, they have that capability. When you have guys that don't, typically that's when you hear the expression that a guy lacks football awareness. Right? Those sometimes, you can play with those guys, but there's issues when the pitcher changes. And if the pitcher changes on guys, you have to be okay with the inconsistency of it. 
comes to Drake and the fumbles, where do you balance coaching and emphasizing it versus not drilling it sure. into his head so much that it's a thing? Right. With any, you can go through any kind of turnover, and there's usually a reason, a variable, or a why. Quarterback interception, a fumble, and more times than not, you can trace them back to fundamentals, intent, or there is the unknown variable where a play just happens by the defense, right? A tip, right? You had the ball secure, and that guy's just stronger. They have you up, and they just rip it, right? And fundamentals can only take you so far when it's outmatched at times. In terms of all those, you know, we go back to the same thought process. Understand the most important thing when you have that ball in your possession is the ball. Um, he is the first person who would raise his hand or anybody like a quarterback who throws an interception is the first one who feels it first. They understand the issue. Um, but you love the intent of all our players when, it, when something that doesn't go right happens. You want to see reaction. So for him, right, we'll use him as an example. Early, earlier in that game, right, that occurs on a fourth and two. Since that point in that game, you want to see how a player responds. You can tell a player, hey, forget about it, let's go, right? But at the end of the day, that player has to have enough self-talk to understand our mental toughness. If you want to have the definition of it, there's a lot of them out there. That's one of them. How they react, not just by word, but by action, once something occurs that obviously was negative. And Drake, I thought, just like a lot of our players this year, have reacted in the positive way. And guys around them have supported him, more importantly. And that's when you truly have a supportive team. You don't have him just being cast off or other guys just being casted off into themselves. You've got guys constantly there to pick each other up. But you also need to pick yourself up. And there's an old saying I was taught as a player from a coach who'd been in the league for a long time. It's one thing as a coach to believe in somebody. The reality is that player needs to believe in himself first. And that's, that goes for anything, right? And just like those situations. So. But again, we always want to, just like a coach, right? We make a bad decision, we have to respond. We can't sulk in it, we can't think about it. Otherwise, the next play is gonna be an issue. And so that's, from a young mindset or a middle-aged veteran to a, a guy who's 10 years plus, you wanna see how they respond. The why and the mechanics of it, are you comfortable with those with where he is there? Yeah, I think it's one of those things where you go out each day, you see the fundamental work they put in, you see the drill work. Again, there's nothing that ever replaces that. So the reputation of doing something over and over and over, right? That ultimately is how you gain confidence. Doing something one-off and having some success probably is not sustainable. But doing something as remedial and as fundamental from a receiver as catching it and tucking it and protecting it, or a quarterback making sure he sees in front of his throw, as fundamental as that sounds, the act of doing it and not getting bored by doing it over and over and over and having a really large capacity for boredom. Because ultimately, great players in this level, the ones that sustain are fundamentally usually really sound, but they always go back to the basic fundamentals. Right? I used to love watching the YouTube videos of the Kobe Bryant things and all that, and he would even talk about the fact of going back to the simplest move every single day and perfecting it. And so that's, that's been part of our mantra, the way we go forward with the fundamentals. I, you've heard me say it now for two years. There is no substitute. So that's how basically we have approached it. Uh, I was watching uh, Texas Tech and Ole Miss in the whatever bowl it was mm. last night. Could you but, name the bowl, do like? No, I, I can't. I, I could. I'll look it up here quick. But the kid <laughs> breaks free again, and uh, six comes up from the back. So it's easy. He was supposed to hold it yep. tight. But and Drake said he had it tight. It no looked like Peanut uh, Tell me. Marlon just comes no in, gets a, a windmill. And I'm that's what I said sometimes, you right? That? You get a situation where a player makes a great play. I'm not taking anything away from what Humphrey did in that play. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also saying, right, you want to control your still controllables in that situation. Drake goes in, right? There's certain things that we teach, just like all players. It's not just him as a ball carrier. Anybody who possesses the ball, there's certain techniques and fundamentals that we believe in that we preach, right? And that'll be constant throughout the rest of this season going into the, for the future. But yeah, and players do make plays, right? Sometimes, but now we were talking about in a different subject here, D-Lite. Well, Texas Bowl. Yeah, I don't know what that was. But we talked about the certain bowl games that I had to play in, uh -huh. right? So we played in the Boise Humanitarian Bowl. 
Yeah, playing Boise State. Oh, I'm the blue car player. In the snow. Yeah. Nothing says, here's your bowl gift. <laughs> like 25 degree weather in Boise, Idaho. I know, yeah. That, see, now we're talking about that too, right? With the new NIL and all those other gifts. I'm not saying that like, you get a bowl gift back in the day. It was like, oh my goodness, can you believe we got? Now it's like. Have you heard that the newest thing the bowl guy said we would consider taking all that money that we're giving to the school? Is that right? And checks to the players, so these players could Is that right? potentially get fifteen thousand dollar check for showing off. Yeah, it's way different now. Yeah. College. I had a, we. I worked with somebody here recently who went back to college football in my past, and uh, he had been out of college for maybe two, three years. Goes back in and, and called me and was like, it's as if I've never been here. It's just a different, right? The NIL, the portal, everything else. And, and it's, it's, a, um, it's a different game, not just on the field, but off the field. Going back to the. Boise? Yeah, it was yeah, beautiful. We snowmobiled, man. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> Week of my life, absolutely. Uh, that in Detroit for the Motor City, in case you care about uh, that one either. Uh, yeah, keep going. You want to go to. Denver's I went to Mobile for the GMAC. I mean, Memphis for the Liberty. Talk about warm destinations for your bowl games. Back when I was covering uh, UCLA, I went to El Paso for the Sun Bowl. Oh, Sun Bowl. Oh, yeah. Like, that was a real riveting. Wow. Warm. Well. Oh, yeah. Warmer than uh, Detroit in winter. Bowl. What's the Shreveport Bowl? I have that Independence. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Bowl week here. I've done Christmas in Shreveport. <laughs> you haven't lived unless you've done Christmas in <laughs> Shreveport. Awesome. Yeah, Nashville, right? Nashville. Um, just uh, running my pass rush numbers, uh, sacks. Of course you were. Not downs, quarterback hits, but you know, just wanted an overall view from you on, uh, you know, how 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 you think they're doing and uh, what you could see here down the stretch. We need the, to be better. The, you pick the one spot that we're probably playing the worst in, so I, that, I'm not surprised. So we need to be better. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also found a good one for you too. The uh, 4.42 yards per carry, 17th in the league. So people are running, but it's it's tougher for them. So the run uh, defense is, uh, you know, at least, a, you know, that that's a, a, a good stat for you there. Uh, uh, you'd like to have it under four. Under four. Okay. Yeah, that's what you'd really like to shoot for. Uh, but it seems like we have seen more running teams as of late with Carolina and, and obviously Baltimore and Chicago and a lot more running teams here as of late as, as opposed to the passing team. So it really, it, you know, the guys don't – I don't get so caught up in the yards. I get really caught up more in the – Average, you know, if, if a team runs for 200 yards, but it's 50 carries, that's 4.0. That's really a pretty good day. You know, it just depends. If they run for 200 yards and it's only 25 carries, that's not a good stat. So, to me, it's it's all really about the the yards per carry. We're doing okay. I mean, we're we're holding our own, um, but we can always improve in that area too. Arthur was talking yesterday about the uh, the uh, the four point swings taking a field goal instead of a touchdown being good on critical downs. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that you guys have been good in those kind of key moments, being able to, even if a team is driving on you, you know, limit them to three as opposed to seven? Well, uh, it's, it's um, I don't know. I just, I, we've just, we've, we've played well. Generally speaking, if, if you make people go the long, hard way, something will happen along there, whether it's a penalty, whether it's a tackle for loss, you kind of get them behind the sticks, then you can kind of get after them a little bit more on third down. The day, the times that we haven't been as good as when we had all those third down and ones, and you know that, those are just hard to stop them on defense. And the other thing is, like we've always talked about in here, the ones that you really don't want are the explosive plays. You know, when we haven't had explosive plays, usually the score stays down. Even, even last week, a couple of the. Uh, you know, the one play, now we end up stopping them, I guess. But it, it was a couple of weeks ago or whatever. It's, it's just kind of like the only scores that we've kind of given up, there's been an explosive play in there somewhere. Usually if you just keep making them grind it out, grind it out, grind it out, usually somewhere along the line they'll either make a mistake or, like I say, a penalty or something and get them behind the sticks and then you got a chance to get them stopped. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's any secret calls. Um, I just think the guys have been – try to teach them that you sometimes just got to really be patient on defense and not get – everybody gets all, boy, as soon as they get a first down, here we go, we got to go blitz and you got to do something. And you don't. You just, you know, it depends on who you're playing. And, 
you know, just to me, don't panic. And I think that's the thing that we've done pretty well in the last seven games is not really got into any kind of panic mode on defense, like even at a halftime, even if we were down like 14 to three or something like that, you know, hey, just well, here's the things they're doing to us. Here's how we got to get it fixed. And I think our guys, probably the, the thing that I'm most proud of with our defense has been the second half, the way we've been able to go in at halftime and adjust and come back out and generally hold them to a touchdown or less in the last so many games. I think there's only two games all year where we've given up more than one touchdown in the second half. And that was the, the first game, New Orleans. And I think Carolina, when they threw the Hail Mary over our day gone head. Uh, other than that, I think we've held them to, you know, one score or less in the second half. And that's also a tribute to these guys understanding the defense now. The more they play it, the more they understand it, the more they know it, the fewer mistakes they have. We don't have as many mental errors as we had early on. So it's, it's kind of all those things. We talk a lot about the way a quarterback can elevate the other 10 guys on offense. Can a dominant defensive guy do the same thing? I'm thinking about J.J. Watt. That's kind of the context that I asked the question in. Sure. Um, I'm sure. I, you know, I've never been on a team – with uh, JJ, but you know, there's always those guys that are the dynamic players on a team. That I mean, I, I think uh, Aaron Donald did yeah. certainly with the Chargers. You know, you always look at a certain guy, especially a D lineman that can just change the game with his pass rush and the way he plays and his relentlessness. I mean, guys, it, it's it's uh, contagious, and uh, you know, I mean, it was that way kind of back. You know, in Baltimore, when I had Ed and uh, Ray, you know, they, they can – all of a sudden Ray gets a hit, and all of a sudden it's like the whole defense just changed. Not that they were ever very bad, but it's just, yeah, those guys can, can elevate everybody. How, how do you – what goes into being that guy? Anything other than just making plays, like, you know, making a bunch of plays? I think it's the guy. It's the guy. I, I don't think, you know, a, a coach can uh, – try to mold a guy into that position. That guy is that guy. That Those guys are that guy. That they're, they were born that way. They probably elevated everybody through college, through whatever. Uh, and if I remember the story about J.J., I think he started out in Central Michigan, was went to Wisconsin as a walk-on or something. I don't know. It's just those guys elevate – they are who they are. It's their personality. I don't think coaches can – I mean, I've coached a bunch of good, really, really good players that were very quiet, you know, but they, they probably didn't elevate as a leader. They were really good players, but th those guys are just, that's their personality. That's who they are, and people tend to gravitate to them. So I don't, I don't think it's something that you can, oh, I, I'm going to make that guy. That, nah, he's either got it or he doesn't. And you try to find the guys in that position when you recruit in college and when you draft, you want to find that guy. Uh, what are you expecting from the uh, Cardinals with uh, McCoy coming back? Uh, I don't think it'll. Hopkins and Connor, the mix of. Uh, well, uh, they, to me, they got a group, heck of a group of wide receivers. When you start looking at names, I mean, they got four guys that were, or three guys that at least were number ones on their team. You know, AJ Green was the number one, Hopkins the number one. Uh, Anderson was the number one. Then you got Dagon uh, Hollywood. I mean, you got a bunch of guys. I mean, they got great leaders there. I, this back, Connor is is a heck of a player. I mean, I had saw him at Pittsburgh up close and personal a few times, and I mean, he is a really really good player. I don't think the the quarterback thing. Uh, I wouldn't make too much of it. They're probably going to have certain things for McSorley. They're going to have thir certain things for McCoy. They're they're going to run what they run, but. They got a talented, talented group of skilled guys. Very talented. And uh, speaking of leadership, any advice for Ed as he was named the head coach at Bethune Cookman this week? Yeah, it'll be Ed. I guarantee you, this this could be this would be a fun place to play. I'll tell you that. And he will do a heck of a job recruiting. That to me sounds like they're taking the Deion Sanders approach here and bringing in a guy like that. He's he's a dynamic, dynamic personality. And a great, he was a great player, but he's also just he, – he will attract a lot of, a lot of good people. The, uh, the quarterback spot opposite A.J., we saw Cornell play a lot more last week. We've seen Darren fill in there. Like, where is the state of that spot? Uh, week to week. Yeah. It's week to week, kind of whoever practices the best that week. Um, and just because he starts may not be 
uh, we may play the other guy, and if the other guy's playing well, leave him in. It, it's really both both of them. It's rotating. Oh, sorry. What have you thought of Darren? over a larger sample size to kind of put, like after Casey got hurt, I mean, Darren Hall. They've done all right. They, they you know, they've, they've done well. They've done what we've asked them to do. Uh, cornerback's probably one of the toughest positions to play on defense in a way. It's probably the easiest in terms of different calls and having to do a lot of different things like backers do and safeties do and all that kind of stuff. But it's the toughest one because you're out there on an island. It's just a tough position in this league because it's just the wide receivers are talented, talent. Everybody's got them, and you're going to have to match up on them. And so, uh, but I think those guys have done a very good, you know, they've done a good job, and that, that's all I can ask of them.